welcome back to Economy Disrupted. I'm Sarah Ladislaw, Senior Associate here at CSIS. I want to say a big thank you to the audience for joining us and also to say quickly uh, a quick thank you to our sponsor, the Howmet Aerospace Foundation. And I'm Matthew Goodman, Senior Vice President for Economics at CSIS and co-host along with Sarah of this show. Um, we In this program, we focus on four major economic disruptors, uh, trade, technology, climate change, and changes in the workforce, um, and how they affect not only the U.S. economy, but also America's international leadership. So this week, we're focused on economic disruptors in the great state of California, and we're very pleased to have with us today, Lieutenant Governor Eleni Kunalakis. Thanks for joining us, Lieutenant Governor. Great to be with you, Sarah and Matt. So we're gonna start with a few of our own questions, uh, but after we get through about four different sets of questions, we're uh, towards the end of the show, we're gonna to go to the audience for questions. So for all of you who are tuning in out there, please don't forget, use the submit questions button on the screen so you can get your questions in and we can get them reviewed in time to ask. So Lieutenant Governor, um, you are the second highest ranking official in the largest uh, state in the union a, with an economy that rivals the economies of you know, major countries in the world. Could you please just start to orient us by telling us what is the job of the lieutenant governor? And in particular, what role do you play in international affairs? Well, Sarah, first, it really is terrific and a great honor to be here with you and, and the CSIS community uh, out here from uh, all the way out in California on the Pacific Rim and to share some thoughts and, and a little bit of our perspective. So um, in terms of what the lieutenant governor does, I get this question all the time. Every state has a different role for the lieutenant governor. Some states don't have them at all. And in California, we're elected separately from the governor, which means that over the years, sometimes they're of the same party, sometimes different parties. And so the role has really changed. In my case, uh, the governor and I have a very strong cooperation. We've known each other and uh, worked together. He was the mayor of San Francisco and, and uh, I was on a commission in San Francisco, spent a lot of time working with him. So it's a very long relationship. So um, in addition to the ordinary work of the Lieutenant Governor, which is very highly focused on public higher education in our state, uh, as well as environmental issues, uh, I also work very closely with the governor, and in particular, he, by executive order, designated me California's representative for international affairs and trade. And I know we're going to be talking a lot about those issues uh, here today. Excellent. We'll turn to Matt to get us started on the first tranche of those issues. Okay, terrific. Well, thanks, Lieutenant Governor. Um, again, delighted to have you with us. Um, so we're going to start with trade. And, you know, the obvious issue to start with, and I'm sure you get asked about a lot, is the uh, question of supply chains, and particularly the fact that, you know, two of uh, the, the, well, the two busiest state uh, ports in the United States are in California, uh, the Port of Los Angeles and the Port of um, Long Beach. And uh, they, I think, bring in something like 40% of the maritime imports in the United States. And obviously, there have been these uh, disruptions, um, and, and trade has been slowed and we've, we're all feeling it over here, even on the East Coast. So help us understand kind of what's happening, what you're doing about it and how it's gonna help build uh, sort of longer term supply chain resilience uh, for the country. Uh, absolutely. So um, as you mentioned, California uh, is very uh, important in US trade. Uh, the port of Long Beach and LA alone, are it's the largest port complex in the Western Hemisphere, about 40%, as you said, of containerized shipping into the United States comes through that port complex uh, alone. And as we sit out here in sunny California, about 89 container ships are anchored off of the coast. Uh, this has been going on now for many months. It's not even the peak. We've had at any given time up to more than 100 ships anchored off our coast. To give you a little bit of context, 2018 was a record breaking year. Uh, for California trade and for imports uh, at LA and Long Beach. And we have broken that record in 2021. Uh, it was about 13% higher in terms of the export, the import flow than it was even in 2018 at the pre-pandemic record-breaking level. So uh, a lot of activity and we're working very hard to very quickly scale up our and increase our capacity. And remember, when COVID first hit, 
uh, we were looking at major economic downturns. So there has been this real roller coaster of highs and lows, uh, and uh, we felt it disproportionately out here in California. So uh, the federal government has come to our aid, but we also have had these extraordinary record-breaking budget surpluses uh, in California. You might have read about it. Uh, and this has really colored almost everything going on in our state over the last two years. Again, absolutely unprecedented, absolutely unpredictable. Since early on in the pandemic, we were looking at major budget deficits. Last year, we had a $75 billion budget surplus. This year, we're predicting about a $36 billion budget surplus. And within that, is about two and a half billion dollars being earmarked specifically to uh, improve uh, our uh, uh, capacity at our ports, uh, to train more workers, and to generally deal with some of these supply chain bottlenecks that uh, have been revealed as a result of this major record-breaking numbers of imports that we've had uh, this year. So if I can just a quick follow up on that. So this two billion or so that's being allocated to this, this is going to have sort of both short term uh, impact in terms of just clearing that backlog of 89 ships or whatever. Um, and sort of when would you expect that to start seeing some actual impact and then longer term, presumably changes that will uh, make the capacity sort of uh, larger and smoother? That's right. right. So some of that is going to immediate needs for more trained workers, more um, uh, 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 equipment uh, at port. Some of it is going to longer term. We're going to be setting up a training center down there, $110 million uh, earmark to build a training center to train more uh, workers. I, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about that, uh, the, the um, workforce uh, development uh, investments that are happening here and, of course, as part of the federal government stimulus. Um, but uh, it's going, you know, it's slow going. Some of the other policies, though, that might uh, have had an impact include poli one policy that was never even implemented, which is a potential, we, we, were, we were looking at um, an increased fee for containers that were uh, stalled and not getting moved out of the ports. Um, once it was announced that there was going to be a fee for any of these containers that were sitting on the ports too long, it immediately reduced the number of those uh, containers by about 70%, and that has helped a lot. Uh, but again, this is really unprecedented, uh, and funds are helpful, but also is some of the creative, uh, creative approaches that uh, uh, that uh, managers have been trying to implement to deal with these these huge numbers. Okay, great. Let me just ask one more question, if I can, Sarah, about trade, which is um, a lot of that trade coming in and out of um, Los Angeles and Long Beach is is with Asia and with China in particular. And um, and so I want to ask you, you know, about your relationship because obviously you've got a lot of Chinese investment in California as well. Um, you know, to what extent is China an important part of your sort of trade investment picture? And how is it being disrupted by either the debates we're having here in Washington about China as a strategic competitor, specific policies that are sort of uh, trying to uh, kind of separate our, our, um, our economic engagement in, in certain areas? Um, and, and you've had your own issues in California with the sports and entertainment industries being affected by uh, some of these tensions. So how do you think about China from a sort of economic perspective? Well, drawing the lens back on that a little bit, um, we were talking at the beginning just about the size and the scope of the California economy. And so um, that coupled with being out on the Pacific Rim, of course, California is disproportionately impacted by policies related to trade with every part of the world, but in particular with Asia. Uh, so, um, uh, so we have been following closely the Biden administration's top to bottom review. Um, we are uh, we were disproportionately impacted by the Trump tariffs uh, and watching to see what kinds of changes may come in a tariffs regime. Um, but we also see things from California a little bit differently, I think, because of uh, the diversity of our population. So there are about one point nine million people of Chinese descent 
who live in California, according to the last census, we're about 15% ethnically AAPI in our state. Uh, and by the way, of course, California is, is disproportionately diverse from the rest of the country. We're about 27% foreign born. That means more than one in four of us was born outside of the country. So as a result, we tend to be um, a more culturally diverse and I think a little more culturally open uh, place than other parts of the country. So as we watch the engagement of the United States and Washington's approach to dealing with China in particular, um, my hope, and I think the governor's hope as well, is that California can be something of a stabilizing force in all of this. Um, but of course, we are a subnational government, and though we are disproportionately impacted, uh, we uh, certainly um, are standing by to give input to the federal government, but also to take uh, their lead uh, as uh, they navigate their way through uh, the complications of the relationship between the United States and China. And by the way, you didn't mention, but I will, uh, that I am the former United States ambassador to Hungary uh, during the Obama administration. Uh, so watching all of uh, our global engagement and and certainly from the lens now of, of representing California is part of what I try to do out here in Sacramento. Excellent. Sarah? That's great. Well, let's turn um, to labor and workforce issues if we can for a minute. Uh, one of the things we wanted to touch on was the um, the cost of living for California workers, particularly in terms of housing. Uh, you know, one of the reasons uh, cited for businesses or, you know, workers leaving California is the high cost of housing. How are you dealing with that issue in the workforce, uh, either through, you know, labor and employment incentives or just housing cost issues in general? Well, Sarah, thank you for that question. Um, just again, a little bit of context. Uh, some of you may have heard these reports of California you know, companies are leaving, uh, that kind of rhetoric that we've heard a little bit over the last few years and pointing to things that they may or may not like about our progressive tax policy or politics or other things. But what we've identified is probably the single biggest uh, uh, impact on that question of whether it's companies or individuals living here or leaving really comes down to housing. So my previous, previous life was in housing development here in California. We have not kept up in delivering housing units with the demand for housing. And as a result, we have major uh, constraints on supply. And that has driven up the median house price, uh, which again, some of your viewers may not know how dramatic it is, but our median home price for a single family home in the state of California uh, has reached peaks of around $800,000 for a single family home. And that's not just San Francisco and Los Angeles. We're talking about that, including you know, every part of the state of California. Um, in contrast, Texas and Florida's median home price is somewhere around $300,000 for a single family home. So this is very significant, very real also drives in part our homelessness challenge, which is also a real impact of the quality of life here. So there has been quite a bit of focus of Governor Newsom's administration and the last few legislative cycles around what more we can do. Our first priority is to try to build out urban areas, um, take old older properties that um, are not being uh, used for their best and highest use and transition that into more housing. Um, additional funds for uh, tax credits and housing credits, um, uh, it, all kinds of innovative approaches to try to tackle this problem. Uh, but as you can see, just by those numbers alone of the median home price, we have our work cut out for us. I, I, I will just underscore that again, in my 25 years, 30 years of following and engaging and working uh, on the issue of housing in California, I have never seen this level of focus uh, to try to make a difference and move the dial. 
That's certainly good to hear. That is a, that's a daunting challenge. Turning for a minute, you had mentioned sort of workforce development issues. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about what you're planning on that side. But in particular, a lot of our guests will talk about the important role, obviously, that education all the way from K to 12 to community college to higher education plays in their workforce training and thinking about preparing their workforce for the future. California has you know, held up as an excellent model for education. Uh, but want to talk about how you think about maintaining the quality and, and affordability of that education for your workforce as well. So if you could talk a little bit about that, that would be great. Well, again, I, I, I just want to say it again, that the last two years, these budget surpluses have um, been really game changers for us. Again, $75 billion surplus last year and looking at a $36 billion surplus this year. And that doesn't include all of the additional federal funding that we've gotten from the, the various stimulus packages. So this has been the most important tool in tackling all of our, our challenges, Again, housing, homelessness, poor congestion, uh, uh, health care, and on and on. Um, but in terms of workforce development, um, this is an area where California has excelled. And, and when you think about the story of California, um, it really is that we have been disproportionately positively impacted by the United States generous immigration policies, that 27% foreign born number uh, that I gave you, and we are the number one destination for immigrants into the United States um, from, from many, many countries. Uh, so that being a, a magnet for immigration into the United States, plus our public higher education system equaling being the, the fifth largest economy in the world. A quick example, uh, in my own family, uh, my grandmother in Greece never learned to read or write. She let my father come to California alone, no money, no English. Uh, after the Second World War, uh, he started out as a farm worker, went to Sacramento State University, and in one generation, I was sent back to Europe as an American ambassador. So this pathway of the California dream fuels and drives our economy. We all know it. We all feel it. And that's why education, particularly higher education, is such an important focal point. So we have, again, I, these numbers are so huge. And, and I, I just want to impress them upon your listenership in Washington um, just to help create the, the picture of what we're talking about. We have about 2.8 million students enrolled in public higher education alone in the state of California. About 1.8 million of those students are in uh, the community college system. Uh, and of course, this community college system with 116 campuses, uh, it is the largest higher education system uh, in the world. And uh, we are um, using that as a very important tool and have for a long time to really educate our workforce. There's a lot of reform going on in particular uh, to help make this system more accessible and more affordable to our students. I could talk about this all day, but I just wanna give your listeners one more a statistic on this extraordinary system of higher ed that we have, and that is this, that of all those kids, all those students in public higher education in our state, about 38% are the first in their family to go to college. So this is a, 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 an industrialized system of first-gen students into public higher education, which we are working every day to make as accessible and affordable and user-friendly as possible to turn them into the workforce of the future. Well, certainly would love to talk to you more about that. It all sounds really fascinating, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn it to Matt so we can move on to the next topic. Okay, great. Well, first, let me just say that story about your Greek American heritage will uh, be music to the ears of my Greek American wife who, ha who has a similar family story and, and uh, we'll try and get you together to compare notes. Um, 
And let me just also remind our audience that you're welcome to submit questions. We're getting some already, but if you have questions, please uh, use the button on your screen to submit questions, and we'll try to get to a few of those at the end. But let me shift to technology, Lieutenant Governor, and um, let me start by asking about the digital divide because you know obviously the internet was uh, was if not founded, developed uh, first in California. And uh, you have pretty good broadband access out there, but you're still like something like 80 plus percent of people. But low income houses is much lower. Um, and particularly, you know, for low income houses, uh, uh, households needing access to uh, the full range of digital services that allow them to get those op educational opportunities. It's still, you know, there's still a, a challenge, a gap. Can you talk a little about that and what you're doing to address that that problem? Well, people have been. Um jumping up and down about the need to improve high-speed internet access in our state, particularly in rural areas of the state, particularly in underserved areas, uh, particularly in um, uh, areas that are disproportionately represented by people of color. But of course, um, the COVID crisis here in California, like everywhere in the country, has really driven uh, that divide much further. Um, we had some major advances in getting more technology into the hands of students uh, in going online uh, with our system of public higher education. I mean, just, just incredible movement into uh, the use of technology for, uh, for education and for work. Uh, but we are still about 10% of uh, people in California do not have access to high-speed internet access. Uh, and some of that is in areas where it's technically high-speed, but it's not really uh, functional um, for a variety of reasons. And so this has been, again, with this incredible budget tool, a priority. So the governor, and I'll, I'll give you some specifics on this um, for your listeners, because I know that there is quite a bit of interest and there's a great deal of opportunity. It is a six billion dollar package, uh, which will deliver about $3.25 billion to create a state-owned middle mile network. Uh, and this will um, allow open access for pro providers uh, to, um, uh, to interconnect on equal economic terms. So this is pretty exciting. We've already identified 18 locations for the Middle Mile uh, project, and there's quite a bit of excitement about it. Uh, it also includes $2 billion for last mile connections into homes uh, and businesses and all kinds of money for other programs, loans uh, to help individuals get connected. So we will see um, how well we're able to leverage those funds to pick up that uh, 10%. But if you fly over the state of California, you see a high concentration of development along the coast. Uh, we are, um, a, a, the, 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 a, a, again, you look at the Eastern seaboard and compare it to the Western seaboard. California is like many, many states combined. And we have whole areas within our state that are prime for economic development, but need to have uh, the development of, uh, of access to those areas in order to take advantage of the economic development um, opportunities in those parts of the state. Okay, well, again, a lot more to talk about there, I'm sure, but let me ask one more question about technology, which is um, sort of the big, in a way, tension between the fact that California is the, of course, home of, um, Silicon Valley, and you're at the forefront of innovation in the technological space, but you're also kind of at the forefront of regulation in the in the technology space. For example, uh, California has a, 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 a far more broad reaching uh, privacy law uh, than than most other states, and there's no federal um, you know comprehensive privacy law. So you're sort of in the forefront of of some of the key regulatory debates as well. Um, so. Is this something that is a kind of a tension because you're trying to promote innovation? You know, back here, we're talking a lot about regulating big tech companies um, or even breaking them up. And um, I wonder how that conversation goes in California, how important it is to your economic future. Well, the, um, the effort to create in California, what many of you are familiar with in Europe, the GDPR standards, ours is called CCPA. Uh, this was driven by 
uh, by California voters. Uh, they collected the signatures, put it on the ballot, and passed a privacy law here that, as you say, uh, is the closest thing to GDPR that we have in the United States. Uh, frankly, we are all far better off in the U.S. if we have one standard, but because that was adopted by an initiative, uh, it, whatever the United States does can't be less uh, restrictive than what the people have voted on here. Um, and of course, it wouldn't have been necessary if uh, the United States had moved forward with privacy laws. I mean, I think that it's probably because we are all so accustomed and, and adoptive of technology and, and, and our level of adoption is so high. And as you noted, I mean, this is the birthplace of the fourth industrial revolution. I think that's probably why people have demanded uh, the basic protocols for privacy protections here. But um, as anyone can say, who's trying to get through firewalls and do I agree, do I not agree? Um, how is this clogging up my ability to access uh, all of the great um, apps that we now rely on? Um, we want it to be uh, protective, but we will also want it to be simple and user friendly. So, um, uh, so I think California will continue to be on the cutting edge. Uh, but you may have noticed there are quite a few experts from California who've made their way to Washington, D.C. as part of the Biden administration. So hopefully that will help uh, the U.S. government um, move forward with, uh, with something that parallels what we're doing here. Um, on the point of monopolies and breaking up companies, um, it's, it's actually kind of the opposite because these are big California companies. And what, what we do want to see is that if there is a federal approach, um, that we also don't undermine the benefits that we all know uh, that, that interconnectedness uh, brings to us. Uh, so we'll be watching it very closely and hopefully inputting uh, as much as we can from our experience here. Sorry. Okay, great. A debate that's obviously going to continue um, and involve both Washington and California, I'm sure, in, in constant uh, dialogue. So over to you, Sarah. Great. Thank you. Lieutenant Governor, I wanted to turn to climate change uh, uh, really quickly. Uh, you led the California delegation to the UN Conference of Parties COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland this past year. I was there too, so hopefully you had a good time. Uh, wanted to know what were the things that you brought from California's experience to talk to the other sort of subnational communities that were there as examples of things that you know California has done well or solutions you were putting on the table and what did you hear from other countries that you brought back to California? Well um, it was a, a really I'm sure a, it was it was an incredible thing to be there uh, and uh, I was so honored to represent California. I think um, to me, the top line story of COP26 was the degree to which the Biden administration was intent on showing that America was back in, back at the table, uh, ready to engage. But of course, what you would then kind of hear on the sidelines is, well, what if the last administration, you know, their uh, uh, completely opposite uh, approach comes back again. What does that mean for the world's effort in combating climate change? And that's where California really comes in. Because as you know, even though the United States left Paris, California, because of our ability to set our own emission standards, we stayed in the Paris Accord. Uh, and um, the Trump administration, for those of you who don't know, actually filed lawsuits trying to take away California's ability to set our own emission standards, which we've had since the 70s. So I don't need to go through the long history of timeline of California's advocacy on environmental protection and on decarbonizing, but it is long and it starts with the catalytic converter uh, and it goes to the fact that last year before anybody else, Governor Newsom set a goal 
of only selling zero emission vehicles in the state of California as new cars starting in 2035. So we are all in on this. Uh, we have found partners across the country. The Ford Motor Company uh, stood with Governor Newsom and said, even if the US government says we don't have to do it, we understand that the only way we're really going to be able to combat climate change is if we uh, transition away from the combustion engine. So, um, so a lot of exciting things. Here's what I would like to leave to all of you watching. If you are interested in the clean energy space, there is no better place to be right now than in California. Uh, just in terms of the intentionality of the governor and the state, we have now proposed over uh, $22 billion for the next five years, including $15 billion in last year's budget surplus, all to go toward climate resiliency and a clean energy future. Uh, there is so much opportunity to make a difference, to, to start up and advance private companies in this state uh, to meet the market of the future here and the standards that we have, our 2045 standards, than any time in history. Uh, and this has always been a good place uh, to engage in this kind of, uh, of, of economic activity. So um, we are building, um, off, we're advancing offshore wind. We are building uh, a system of fueling station stations, we are investing in battery technology, every conceivable area of moving toward an energy energy uh, independence from fossil fuels. Uh, it is top of the list in terms of California's vision for the future. And uh, I think uh, is going to be a remarkable uh, change in our ability to scale up climate solutions that will allow us uh, to lead the way on um, addressing the impacts of climate change. And I won't talk about wildfires, but let me just say those words to all of you. You know what we've been going through here. We are extremely motivated uh, to, uh, to uh, scale up climate solutions. Well, you, you actually went where I was going. I'd love to talk to you about some of the particular policies, but I do think you know, the other thing that listeners do think about when they think about climate change in California is the wildfires, right? Just heartbreaking scenes of, uh, of, of both the air pollution and the loss of life and the loss of properties and things like that. How are you thinking about the future of wildfires in California and really, you know, as you said, you know, focusing on trying to build resilience and think about the long term solution for those types of issues? So four of the five uh, most catastrophic wildfires in history happened in 2020. Uh, we have been investing in more equipment. We have worked, continued to work in develop the technology and working with NOAA, uh, our universe, our research universities at the University of California to forward deploy equipment based on predicting wind patterns. We have deployed uh, camera technology in our forests. Uh, we are looking at uh, improving forest management. Again, we were uh, heavily criticized by the Trump administration, but of course, uh, a great deal, a very high percentage of our, of our forested lands are uh, owned and managed by the federal government, but we are working very closely with the federal government in order to be able to improve land management and increase fire breaks. But what I learned uh, when I was out visiting the location of Paradise, which tragically burned uh, an enormous loss of, of life, or in places like Coffee Park in Santa Rosa, which is what you would think of as a regular everyday subdivision, um, the, the weather patterns that are created by wildfires of this size and scale, uh, in addition to the heavy winds, in addition to a forest die-off of 150 million trees directly related to climate change. All of this is creating things firefighters tell me they've never seen before. Fire tornadoes that, that vaporize houses and leave everything uh, just barren down to uh, the, the concrete pads that homes were built on. Uh, fires that were able to travel at the rate of one football field for, per second. 
uh, these are uh, massive challenges and we're getting better and we're continuing in our effort to find new technology. But the bottom line with wildfires is that you have to detect them and put them out quickly because once they become enormous, when they, once they hit the tipping point of becoming too big to be able to put out quickly, uh, it's very hard to put them out before uh, they have created enormous damage. Okay, well, I think we've gotten to the point where we'd like to take some audience questions. We have ourselves lots more to ask about, but we're still welcoming questions. If you have them, please submit them. But let me ask you, uh, Lieutenant Governor, a question about housing, uh, an area you know something about. Again, uh, you talked about the high price of housing. Uh, this um, viewer is, is making the point that there's a scarcity in ha of housing in California, yet many local communities have limits on housing production. How can California build more housing, including through new housing types like accessory dwelling units, which I'm sure you know what that is, but um, uh, that's the question. So um, more thoughts on housing would be helpful. Thank you. You know, we have made a lot of progress on this in the last four years, really actually starting with, uh, with Governor Jerry Brown. Uh, during Jerry Brown's governorship, we passed laws making it much, much easier to build those ADUs. Some people call them granny flats or in-law units. Uh, and we have seen a huge increase in the number of applications to build those accessory dwelling units on existing uh, parcels. Uh, the governor also passed legislation this year allowing by right the ability to build an additional unit on a single family home lot. Uh, so we're very hopeful that these kinds of things in the aggregate are going to help. Uh, we have had for decades in our um, planning laws, uh, requirements of counties to produce a certain number of housing. Uh, for many years, even though they were required to identify locations uh, where housing would go, there was really no uh, teeth in those laws uh, uh, that would ensure that regions produce them. And we developed a culture of nimbyism, not in my backyard. And by the way, you know, people understand that if those housing units down the road don't get approved, maybe the equity in their home is going to go up a little bit. So we have a lot of competing interests in all of this. But by and large, um, we think that the uh, the uh, 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 efforts, the early efforts over the last few years to make it easier to build those extra dwelling units, that is going pretty well. Um, but of course, uh, we know there's a lot more we can do. If you're in California, if you read the newspapers, you're starting to see a lot more of these projects that could never get through reappearing in different forms. This idea that um, when someone would put forward a, a, a project for, and this is my own personal experience, you would put forward a, a um, proposal and um, you would see the numbers of units chipped away, chipped away, chipped away. Well, now we're doing the opposite with bills that will allow for housing for, for density bonuses, particularly if you include um, affordable housing units uh, in those projects. And then of course, there's just um, tax credits and those kinds of programs that will make uh, it easier for developers to propose housing units and actually able, be able to get them built when we do, of course, have very high, high standards for construction uh, in our state. So all of these together, we hope are going to make a difference. Um, but again, when you look at those numbers I was talking about before and the supply constraints that uh, the person asking the question referenced, we have a long way to go. Okay, we've got another question here. It says California's active aerospace industry has contributed to many historical milestones for the nation. As more states compete to attract this industry to their state, what's California doing to retain its aerospace companies and ensure the industry's growth? Well, right before the shutdown, I was uh, thrilled to welcome uh, to my office leaders of the aerospace industry across the state and, and talk about, um, as you noted, the really incredible history of uh, the aerospace industry in California, um, 
certainly in the past, uh, we had uh, uh, we had quite a few military bases, and then particularly down in Southern California, um, not just federal facilities, but then of course, uh, everything from Lockheed Martin to Hughes to Boeing, um, all kinds of great companies doing um, important work, uh, which of course provides the exact kind of jobs that we want to be able to offer uh, uh, Californians, great paying jobs, engineering jobs, uh, jobs in um, all kinds of innovation and construction. So um, we uh, had a pause last year in our tax credit program for R&D. Again, that was mostly because of concerns over budget deficits. Uh, the governor has uh, 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 opened those programs back up again. So I'm very hopeful that uh, the aerospace industry will be at the front of the line. And by the way, uh, those who get top priority for uh, access, uh, accessing those tax credits are the ones who aren't just don't just have facilities here, but are actually headquartered here. And that's a direct response uh, to wanting to show how much we value those traditional industries that have done so well in California and that of course have lifted us up. Um, let me um, ask another one, which is a kind of aligns with questions that we've been asking other um, governors and mayors who've been on this program, which is um, how is California working with the federal government and other state governments to take its early adoption policies for privacy, climate, et cetera, to other states and nationally? And, and in particular, I'm interested, we ask again, other um, governors and mayors about how they both learn from um, other counterparts in other states and how they may help, um, you know, help them, uh, the, the other uh, states do better on some of these issues. Is that a dynamic that, that you've been uh, seeing and particularly as the big, uh, the big kid on the block, um, did more people turn to you than, than you learn from them or is there sort of a both way dynamic? You know, we're just so, we're, we're just such a large state. Uh, some people have called us a nation state. I, I don't love that because uh, we are one nation uh, and I think it's important to always uh, think of everything we do in California through that lens, but we're the most populous state. We're number one in, in two-way trade, in manufacturing, uh, in foreign direct investment. We have uh, the county, just the county of Los Angeles has a population about the same as the country that I was ambassador to. So the level of cooperation, not just at the state level, but at the regional level, at the city level, with counterparts uh, across the country and around the world, um, it's, it's honestly, it's just endless. Um, I don't even know where to, where to begin. I mean, I think probably the best example is one that I alluded to, which is that California stayed in uh, the uh, climate accords, the Paris Climate Accords, but we didn't do it alone. We did it with a coalition of other states, which made up uh, more than half of the population of the country. So, uh, so we do a lot. And, and I'll also add to that, that it's not just um, in the United States, it's also in the world. Um, one of the things that we're very proud of, again, it's in this climate space, uh, is uh, uh, the um, uh, the under two coalition, uh, which is really worth talking about because it was born in Sacramento during a visit of the Baden-Württemberg region of Germany, uh, where uh, they, uh, as a subnational government within Germany, were um, aligned with California on our 2035 goals and our, our emission reductions. And we came to, together to come up with the list of things that we could do to keep uh, climate change under two degrees Celsius, uh, warming more than two degrees, right? And uh, since then, hundreds of subnational governments around the world and in the United States have joined along uh, it, it, it is probably the best example of this. So um, whether it's at the state level or whether it's cities convening in LA or San Diego or San Francisco or Sacramento or Fresno on agriculture uh, or up in, in, in Lake Tahoe on conservation, there is so much 
uh, that we do. And again, that's why I think it's so important to have a chance to talk to all of you because, um, you know, California in many ways is the, uh, the goose that is laying golden eggs for the country. And, and we have our challenges and we need help from the federal government in addressing our challenges, but we also uh, need support in order to be able to continue uh, to, uh, to lead the way. This is great. Well, we want to ask you one question that we ask everybody who comes on the show, which is kind of the premise for some of these conversations. CSIS is an international, you know, foreign policy oriented think tank. And for this administration and the previous administration, we've seen a recognition that foreign policy might have been a little detached from normal, average, everyday middle class workers, right? Or middle class, uh, we, we, you've heard it explained as foreign policy for the middle class. And so, We'd like to ask the folks that come on the show, what does that mean to you for the United States to have foreign or international policy that is representative of, you know, the sort of middle class or the sort of economic dimensions in your state? Well, again, I, I was a United States ambassador. So I think about our place in the world um, more than I'm sure most other elected officials do. Uh, of course, California shares uh, the most active border in the world, uh, the border between California and Mexico. Uh, we have these ports and, you know, enormous activity and trade as a result of that uh, and our location on the Pacific Rim and our the fact that 27% of us were born in another country. So all of that, I think, does to some degree keep foreign policy issue at a higher level um, in our state than in, than in others. Um, but, you know, many people are watching the Olympics right now. They saw that President Biden was not there at the opening ceremonies, but they saw President Xi standing side by side with, uh, with uh, Vladimir Putin. Um, I think that the focus um, uh, or, or that international affairs for the average person on the street going to work, listening to the radio, talking to their friends, I think it's really coming more uh, into focus for people. Um, and I think that people are worried in a way that they haven't been, particularly when they see the bickering and the fighting going on in Washington, D.C., and how difficult uh, it is that our own fellow Americans are making it for the president and the vice president, our daughter of California, Kamala Harris, uh, to do their job. So, um, uh, so I think that people are talking about foreign policy and experiencing it on, on a different level. And to that end, California is a great model because uh, we, generally speaking, um, now, again, we're a super majority of Democrats. Uh, we Every single one of our statewide elected officials is a Democrat. Uh, we have three quarters of our legislature are Democrats. But believe me, there is a lot of plural thinking that's going on in California about the best approach to doing things. All these things we've talked about, education and healthcare and homelessness, and housing, uh, technology, on and on plenty of debate, but we don't, it, it's not, uh, it's not win at all costs kind of policy advancement, the way that we see Washington, D.C. If we cannot figure out how to work together in order to address these challenges at home and be able to work together across party lines to, to meet the international challenges at hand, I, again, I, I think that that's something that I've been saying since I came home from Hungary, but something that is more and more of a dinner table conversation and something I hope that we in California can show um, what it means to be able to focus debate on solving our problems and working together on the bigger challenges at hand. Well, that's a great sentiment to, to end on and to be sort of um, inspiration for our continuing conversations here on this show and in Washington more broadly, where, where you know, we need more of that kind of uh, approach and thinking. Um, let me just say, you mentioned the Olympics. I know you've got a small sporting event of your own coming up next weekend. I think it was very clever of you to arrange to have it in Los Angeles and to have 
the Los Angeles team uh, play in the uh, in that You're game. You're talking about the Super Bowl. Um, I'm talking you about know, the Super Bowl. I, I, you could I, have been talking about the NASCAR races that are happening in oh, LA. But that, okay. that was, that All was right. yesterday. We're not tracking that as closely, but uh, but I'll certainly tune in now. But and uh, the fact and the fact that we also have Olympics coming to Los Angeles that That's we're right. preparing for. That's right. Well, I wasn't. Not at pick... all. All right. Well, there's a lot going on out there, obviously, but we've been delighted to have you. Uh, with us and um, really appreciate your insights, a lot to chew on there. And uh, we hope we'll get you back to CSAS sometime to talk about Hungary and, and the proud challenges over there. We're talking a lot about that as well. But um, but this has been a, just a terrific uh, tour de force and we, we really appreciate your joining us, uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, Kunalakis, and uh, we, we hope to have you back. Um, th th thank you, uh, thank you to you. Thank you to our audience for joining us. Um, we'll have our next episode coming up with another local uh, official, uh, Governor Mayor um, or local official, and uh, we hope you'll join us then. But thank you, Governor, uh, Lieutenant Governor, for joining us. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, everyone at CSIS. Great to be with you. All right. Great to be with you. Thanks so much. And, and we'll see you all soon.